John chapter 2. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Let us pray. Lord, forgive us for choosing other gods that are appealing but cannot offer true fulfillment. Forgive us when we forget your promises and replace them with empty promises. Uphold us with your free spirit and light the fire of your love within our hearts. Make us hungry for a deeper relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Scripture and prayer. Dave, if you'd come. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, it's good to come to you, and it's good to come to you in a great place to worship you, Lord. Thank you for that. We just ask for your blessing on this service and the word that we're about to hear, Lord. Help us to hear it. Help us to see what your plan is for us. Help us to understand it. In Jesus' name, amen. Scripture today is from Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. 
I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who, he who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. You can be seated. I want to recognize a couple of our guests from Norway uh, who are uh, here while a couple of our soldiers or several of our soldiers, I think, are over in Norway, kind of an exchange. Would you guys mind if I made you stand up so people can clap for you? Thanks very much. You can sit down. As you can see, they have become acclimated to Minnesota. They have Minnesota sweatshirts, so you guys are right in there. I want to talk to you this morning about the Church of Smyrna, which was the suffering church out of the seven churches that the Apostle John wrote to in the book of Revelation. But before we go to Smyrna, I just want to do a little bit of a review of the Church of Ephesus. As you remember, these are seven churches that Jesus addressed in what is now Turkey, then called Asia Minor, and last, uh, now called Turkey, then part of Asia Minor. And uh, last week we looked at the church of Ephesus that lost their first love, and Jesus threatened that church that if they didn't straighten up and love him as they ought, he would remove their lampstand. What you see in front of you has become an emblem of the nation of Israel. Kids, if you're taking notes and you have that in your notes, it's probably on page two or three inside and you can mark in the blank, Israel. That is the emblem or one of the emblems of Israel. The lampstand was a very important part of Jewish worship in Old Testament times, still is in New Testament times among the Jews. Uh, it represents God as being light, but it represents more than that. It represents the Jewish people being the light that would carry God's light to the rest of the world. Unfortunately, they didn't do that. They were not a testimony of the Messiah. And so their lampstand was taken away in the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple back in 70 AD by the Roman Empire, the menorah. Uh, was taken away, the lampstand was taken away, uh, they lost their glory, their witness was lost, their glory departed, and the relief, which is in the form of a menorah, is still to be seen on the Arch of Ti Titus, which is in Rome, as the victory of the Roman Empire over the Jews way back in early times in the first century. God chose the New Testament church to be his light bearer. And so in this particular set of letters to seven churches, he speaks of them as being lampstands that are set to give light to the world. And he walks among the lampstands, Jesus does, and he shares uh, the light of the gospel. He shares the light of what he had, what he came for when he came to this earth. Now let's talk a little bit about the second church, which is the church of Smyrna. As I mentioned in the beginning, it's a suffering church. You can see by the numbers where the different churches were. Uh, the P stands for Patmos, the island of Patmos off of the coast of what is now Turkey. And the numbers uh, represent the various different areas. Number one is where Ephesus was, and number two is where Smyrna was back in that day. Um, Literally, Smyrna, the city of Smyrna, was a resurrected city. It's an amazing story. Uh, we don't know exactly how old Smyrna was. Some say that it was in existence back in 3000 BC. The first really known history we have was when it was a Greek settlement that dated back to 1000 BC. And uh, it was destroyed by the Lydians in 600 BC and laid totally in ruins, dormant for three centuries until in the year 290 BC, uh, successors, two of the successors of Alexander the Great rebuilt that city. And it has always been known, or it had always been known at that time, as the resurrected city, the city that died and came back to life again. 
Today it thrives as the city of Izmir, and it's the second largest city in Asiatic Turkey. Uh, back in that time, there was a hill in the city, still is there, but not with all the buildings. And at the top of the hill was a ring of temples and public buildings that was called the Crown of Smyrna. It's important for you to remember that, the Crown of Smyrna, and also that Smyrna was the city that came back from the dead. It's hailed as one of the most beautiful cities in Asia at that time. One of the ancients uh, who wrote about the city of Ismer in the second century said this about it. Stand on the Acropolis. The sea flows beneath you. The suburbs lie about you. The city through three lovely views fills the goblet of your soul. A shining mass of gymnasia, markets, theaters, baths, so many baths that you hardly know where to bathe, fountains and public walks, running water in every home, the abundance of her spectacles, contests, and exhibition, exhibitions is beyond telling, and the variety of her handcrafts. Listen to this, of all the cities in that part of the world at that time, of all the cities, this is the best suited for those to, who like to live at ease. That's another important thing to remember. The city of Smyrna uh, was a faithful ally of Rome. Uh, they were chosen through a set of circumstances to be the very first place where a temple was erected to an emperor. And in 26 AD, uh, a temple was erected in that city to the emperor Tiberius. Now let's look at the letter uh, to the Smyrna church itself. And you'll notice that it begins with these words in verse 8. These are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and who came to life again. Notice how he uses that as a description of himself. Jesus does. He uses the same description of himself that the people of Smyrna used of their city. It died and it came to life again. Each of these letters, these seven letters, begins with a description of Christ that's particularly applicable to the particular church that he's talking about and sending his letter to. He is the first and the last. Other biblical writers, even the writer of Revelation, speaks of Jesus as being the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, the one who was and the one who is and the one who is to come. He transcends all frontiers of time and space. Isaiah spoke of him. Back in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6, this is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty, I am the first and the last. Apart from me, there is no other God. He is the A and the Z, the Alpha and the Omega, and every letter in between. He is infinite. He is holy. He always has been, and he always will be, and he is now who died and came to life again. He is the living God. I can remember when I was uh, in high school in the 60s, that dates me, and then in college in the 60s as well, I can remember a movement that was really started by the works, the written works of Friedrich Nietzsche, the God is Dead movement. It was a movement that really captivated people who lived in the 60s and perhaps in the 70s. In recent days, within the last uh, two decades, a man by the name of Christopher Hitchens has written a book, I think it was written in 2006, called God Is Not Great. I went on the internet uh, a few days ago and read a number of excerpts from his writings and after reading only 20 or 25 quotes, I was absolutely sick to my stomach about the things that he says about God, the thing, things that he says about Christianity. It just, it, it just made me ache inside. Yesterday, as I was just kind of thinking through my sermon again, I, somebody had said, Chris, I think you had told me that, or uh, Doug had, that 
that you thought you had read someplace that Christopher Hitchens' brother was a Christian. He is. He was raised in the same family. The boys were very close in their age. Um, Christopher Hitchens did not like his brother Peter and at one time told him that he was adopted just to give him a bad time. Um, Christopher always leaned towards the atheistic side. His brother uh, grew up as a Christian in a Christian home, but in his teen years fell far away from God, but eventually, gradually came back and today is a devout Anglican Christian. He and his brother uh, went to many, many debates together. I read, if you want to look it up and have some interesting reading this afternoon, just go to Christopher Hitchens' brother. Christopher Hitchens brother. And there are all kinds of things that you can read there that will help you grow in your own Christian faith as you read about the, the, uh, the relationship between Peter and his brother, Christopher, who just died, uh, I think in, in 2011. Uh, still very much rooted in his atheistic way of thinking. I, I, I can tell you the truth that God is alive and God is still great. Yeah. He is. The problem is not that God is dead. The problem is that man is dead. The Bible declares that man is dead, that we are dead in our trespasses and sins without Jesus. The truth is that God stooped to earth in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, to taste death for us so that we might be able to taste of life. Because he rose from the dead, we too shall rise. The character of Christ that is pictured in this letter to the church of Smyrna that was suffering great persecution, some of them even dying for their faith is rooted in the fact that Jesus rose from the dead and they had courage and they had hope to face what was coming at them. Of all the churches that John writes to in this uh, book of Revelation, this is the one that he commends the most. He has no instruction for them in terms of anything that they're doing wrong, but he commends them for their faith in the midst of suffering and persecution. Let me just tell you a few things about what they dealt with in Smyrna, what the Christians faced. First of all, Christians were poor. Many of them were slaves. Many of them were destitute. They excluded themselves from the trade guilds because the trade guilds were seedbeds of vice and immorality and unscrupulous dealings. They had on them the double weight of persecution and poverty. Not just poverty of having a little, but poverty of having nothing. The word that's used in the Greek language is very clear. But Jesus says they were rich. They were rich. There are some, and I don't want to name any, but there are some preachers on television today that will tell you, follow Jesus and you will be rich. Jesus never said that. Jesus never put richness materially with richness spiritually. You can maybe be rich materially if you are rich spiritually, but certainly not in the Smyrna church case. They were very, very poor, but Jesus refers to them as being very, very rich in him. Secondly, the Christians refused idol and emperor worship. Smyrna was uh, a place where Rome was worshiped uh, there was a fanatical devotion to Rome. It was a hotbed of emperor worship. In AD 94, the emperor Domitian said these words, if you will not take that incense and throw it on the fire in honor of me as God, then you will be killed because all the emperor, all the empire will worship me. The Christians were willing to obey the laws of the land. They were willing to, visit, willing to uh, submit to the emperor's civil authority, but they would not bow down to worship him. 
It's common for you and me to think in America this day that we, that we will never suffer uh, persecution, that we will never die because of our desire to follow Jesus. Um, that may be true, but it may not be true. The things that are taking place in our world and the animosity towards Christians, some of it well-deserved, puts us in a place where in the coming years we could very well face peril. There could come a day when I'm not able to preach what the Bible teaches because it goes against what the culture says. So I ask you, though you may not face persecution that would bring you to the point of having to give up your life, I do have some questions for you. What or who do you, what or who do you idolize? Is there any one in your life or anything in your life that's more important to you than your relationship with God? Would you risk civil disobedience if the government forced you to do something that was against your Christian conscience? Are you compromising your convictions in any way because you prefer to take the path of least resistance? Are you honest on your job? Are there relationships in which maybe you are romantically involved that you know are not in the center of God's will, but you love the other person more than you love God? I think these are questions that all of us need to face, um, regardless of what age we are, that we place God first in our life. Thirdly, Christians were slandered by the Jews. I don't know whether you knew this or not, but back in the first and second century, Christians were, uh, were persecuted and accused of uh, cannibalism. You say, what? Well, this is how it happened. The Jews knew what the Christians were involved in when they took communion, but the Jews were the ones who snitched on the Christians, and the Romans didn't know anything about communion, and so when they heard about the Christians eating the flesh of Christ and drinking the blood of Christ in communion, they accused them of being cannibals. Secondly, they were accused of atheism because they didn't bow down to the emperor and didn't worship all of the idols that were in Smyrna. They were accused of being atheists. And they were accused of political disloyalty and of rebellion. So the Jews snitched on the Christians very much. And some of the Jews, thinking that they were God's favorites just because of their physical pedigree, did all kinds of unkind things to the Christians by putting them on the spot. The Jews got a pass when it came to worshiping the emperor because all the emperor said was, if you just pray for me in your synagogues, then that's okay. You don't need to bow down to me and worship me or worship my idols. But the Christians didn't have that kind of pass. Jesus, in this passage, instead of calling these Jews that were in Smyrna true Jews, calls them instead the synagogue of Satan. Satan means slanderer or accuser or blasphemer. Jesus, on one occasion in the New Testament, when he was speaking with the Pharisees, said that they were of their father, the devil. Like I said, the Jews were exempted from emperor worship if they prayed for him in the synagogues, but the Christians were always viewed with suspicion and were granted no exceptions, no exemptions, and were severely persecuted. Some of them faced death because of their belief in Christ. In fact, the church in Smyrna was the home of Polycarp, Christians faced martyrdom. The most famous of them was Polycarp, who was burned at the stake on February 23rd, 
of the year A.D. 155. And the Jews collaborated with the Romans in his execution and were some of the most excited people about throwing sticks of wood on the fire where he was burned. The church in Smyrna is a picture in miniature of the great tribulation that will come in the last days. And lastly, I want to speak to you of the consolation that he gives to the church in verses 10 and 11. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you into prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. I like the first four words of that verse. Uh, Do not be afraid, but I don't like what comes after it. I'm not sure about the rest. Jesus doesn't minimize their sufferings. He said, hold on, because it's going to get worse before it gets better. Some of you are actually going to get put in jail. The devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will be persecuted for 10 days. We don't know what that 10 days was, whether it was literal or figurative. Uh, The word or the number 10 is used in Scripture just like the number 7 sometimes, sometimes as as a completion sort of thing to its total fulfillment, kind of a perfect number. So it may be used in the extent that you will be persecuted up to the max you will be persecuted to the peak, but it will be limited. But he says, be faithful even to the point of death. As I've said a couple of times in this series, the only way to be ready to die for Jesus should that day ever come is to be willing to live for him. Those of you uh, young people that are in junior high or I get goofed up with junior high because it was junior high where I grew up. But those of you who are, who are in grade school and middle school and high school, um, live for Jesus. Live for him. You don't have to boast about the fact that you're a Christian, but live like a Christian. It's not going to, if things get tougher than they are now for Christians, it's not going to get any easier for you down the road to stand up for Jesus if you don't stand up for him now. And that goes for us as adults too. I'm not really worried about what's going to happen if someday I am persecuted because I don't say from this pulpit what our culture wants me to say. But I'll tell you what, I'm... I'm going to live for Jesus until that time comes because if I don't, if I don't have the strength to live for him now, I'm not going to have the strength to live for him then. So be faithful. I like the words of John Stott, a famous preacher from England. Or is it Scotland? Um, Is it Scotland, Roland? John Stott? England. I wanted to make sure I got it right. He says, the ugly truth is that we tend to avoid suffering by compromise. Our moral standards are often not noticeably higher than the standards of the world. Our lives do not challenge and rebuke unbelievers by our integrity and purity or love. Jesus says to this passage, and I will give you the crown of life. What did I tell you about Smyrna on the top of the hill? The crown of Smyrna with all of its temples? He's using that as he writes to these people in Smyrna. He's talking to them not about the crown of Smyrna, but but the crown of life. James chapter 1 verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Each of these letters has a great promise at the end. They're not just meant to scare us. They're meant to bring a sense of hope in us so that we will live our lives for Christ. He who has an ear, he says, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. What's that? What's the second death? 
Well, if you know your Bible, you know that the first death is physical, but you know that the Bible also speaks of a second death, which is spiritual. Revelation chapter 20, verse 14 says, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. D.L. Moody put it this way. He said, he who is born once will have to die twice, and he who is born twice will die only once, and maybe not even once, meaning the rapture could take place. Jesus could come and take you to heaven to be with him. I found this, and I think it's a good illustration that's up on the screen and in your notes. The birthday cake that has all the candles represents being born physically. And if you are just born once without being born again, you face death physically, and you face spiritual death or eternal separation from God. But to be born twice, to be born physically, but then to come to a place in your life where you recognize that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is Lord, that he died on the cross for you and for me. And if you accept him as your savior and believe in him, you only die once. And then you go to heaven to be with God for all eternity. Jesus said, you must be born again. So what does all this mean to you and me today? Well, first of all, I think it means that we should trust God for the future by living for him in the present. The Apostle Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Look at me. For me to live is Christ, to die is is gain. Say that with me. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. For me to live is Christ. What does that mean? It means that whether you uh, fix printers or teach in school or are an administrator or grow flowers, Go to college, go to school, fix people up from their physical illnesses. It means that in the midst of all of those settings, you, you live for Christ. For me to live is Christ. It's the, it's the place that he has put you. You may not like it every day. I don't like to pastor it every day but that's the avenue through which he has given you to work and to live. For me, to live is Christ, and if I die today or tomorrow, that's gain, because it's to be immediately with him. So trust God for the future by living for him in the present. Secondly, be spiritually healthy regardless of your material wealth. I'd rather be spiritually healthy than materially wealthy. I'd like both, wouldn't you all? But they don't necessarily come together. So be spiritually healthy. And thirdly, choose obedience. Choose obedience over convenience. If you have your notes, look at one of, uh, well, it's not, actually, it's not, this is not in your notes, but remember what I said earlier about the Smyrna church being the opposite of the city's culture. The city's culture of Smyrna, remember what that ancient said? He said, of all the cities, this is best suited for those who like to live at ease. The American church is much like the city of Smyrna. The culture of the American church is meet my needs. Jesus said, deny yourself. The culture of the American church is for me to get personal fulfillment in what I do. Jesus says, take up your cross 
The culture of America is I want to keep my options open. Jesus says, follow me. The culture of the American church is safety, protection, and freedom. Jesus said that he was broken bread and poured out wine. I close with these words that came from the Apostle Paul, some of them written shortly before his death as he was beheaded for his faith in Christ. I consider, he says, that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. We have within our midst a resident poet. Um, His name is Daniel Laborde. I sensed, uh, I sensed in him at his baptism this past summer um, something that I had never seen before, heard before from him. Um, I'm, I'm more used to him heckling me about my sermons um, and asking me to, uh, to not tell jokes because <laughs> he, he misses, the, misses the point of the sermon by, by the jokes. Um, but we've become good friends, and just three weeks ago, I learned that he was writing some poetry. It's sort of loose poetry. He actually writes it while he's listening to Christian music and makes up his own lyrics. And the title, come on up, Daniel, the title of the, the uh, poem that he's about to, uh, to read to you, you can set it up here, is uh, The End is where it all begins. Can I start? Go for it. You lay on your deathbed, got some kind of cancer up in your head. You tell me this is the end, so long, my friend. I'm sorry, but you're wrong. Don't you have a personal relationship with God? You look at me and nod. Hey, man, he's got a place for you where this world is just a boring old globe. Oh, don't you Who know? The end is where it all begins. Where a lifeless heart lives and starts to beat again. We're met by the Son of God, and sin is just a thought, and a life of perfection where you and God can have a personal connection. This world is like an undefined sight and a long and endless night. Heaven is where we have life and no longer have to fight. So long, my friend, but remember, the end is where it all begins. Why do we fight to keep the beginning from ending? Why do we... He, what, oh, we cry at the end of the beginning, but death is nothing to fear. Yes, it hurts when you lose someone you love, but they go to be with he who is three in one. I can't deny when you lose someone you love, there's nothing wrong with the tears in your eyes. It shouldn't be, you know, whatever, but to the one who's gone, death can be a change for the better. And it's true, when we die, we're gone, but not lost forever. So long, my friend, I guess it's time for the beginning to end, and your broken heart to mend and beat again. The end is almost here, God's spirit is near. Won't you help me remember that the end is where it all begins, where a lifeless heart lives and starts to beat again, when we're met by the Son of God and sin is just a thought, and a life of perfection, where you and God can have a personal connection. This world is like an undefined sight in a long and endless night. Heaven is where we have life and no longer have to fight. So long, my friend, but remember, the end is where it all begins. Stand with me, will you? Father, I thank you for the fact that you once were and that you still are and that you always will be. I thank you for coming to this earth and giving your life as a sacrifice for us so that we could have life eternal. I thank you 
for the fact that you give us the opportunity every day that we live in various spheres of influence to live for you. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I thank you for the poet's pen that you've placed in Daniel's heart. And I pray that you would bless it and that you would use it. There are things that can be shared by way of allegory and poetry that prose can never match. There is a way in which you can touch the heart as well as the mind. And so I pray that you would heighten this gift that you have given to him and that you would use it for your glory, that he would always see it as a gift from you and that he would use it for you. And help us to live in such a way where we realize that the end is really only the beginning. Help us to give our lives for you, whether that means simply living for you or whether it might even mean someday dying for you. We love you with all our hearts and we pray that you would bless us and cause us to be light bearers, lampstands that share your good news with others around us. For I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Worship team, would you come on up and lead us in a closing song? Be faithful.
Be faithful. Be faithful. Be a light. Be a lampstand. Be a testimony. Be a witness. No matter where you are, whether your job seems rather menial or your job seems quite great or you're retired or you don't have a job or you're a student, be faithful. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.